Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club World Affairs virtual program. We're here today to discuss the stories of individuals and communities across America hit by the impacts of climate change and what lessons we can learn about managing a future which will be beset by more extreme weather. My name is Quentin Hardy. I'm an independent tech writer based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And today, it is my pleasure to introduce and speak with Jonathan Vigliotti, CBS News reporter and author of Before It's Gone, Field Notes from the Front Lines of Climate Change in Small Town America. Jonathan is a correspondent based in Los Angeles whose work has taken him all around the world, from war zones, refugee camps, and the Arctic, but in his recent coverage, he has been closer to home. His new book captures stories of many communities across the U.S. devastated by extreme weather events and his own journey covering these numerous disasters. From these deeply moving stories, he has led to a larger view of the crisis that is no longer on the horizon, but affects more of us each day. Jonathan, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for having me, Quentin. So let's just start by having you talk a little bit about your career and the kind of work you ended up specializing in. Yeah, I got my start in journalism at Fordham University. I worked as a reporter at WFUV, the NPR affiliate. This was just after 9-11. And my initial goal and aim was to stick with NPR. I applied for a grant, did not get it. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna try this TV thing. Uh, I always uh, was compelled and loved documentaries. And my first start in television was in Grand Junction, Colorado. And I worked my way up the food chain from Milwaukee to Miami and then New York City for WNBC, the local NBC affiliate, before joining CBS News as a foreign correspondent and then moving to where I am today in Los Angeles based on the West Coast. How do they decide where someone will fit in in the overall news package? How did they figure out your skill set? Because you seem to have fit into just the right sort of job for yourself. That is a great question. Maybe best told by the head of talent who hired me. I would like to think I, I've always found myself most at ease in the field, uh, immersed in the story that is unfolding around me. And I think being live from location after location ultimately led to me coming to here, California, where I cover a lot of wildfires, a lot of extreme weather here, obviously in the West Coast, but have pinballed across the country, very much in the field on the front lines of these storms. And I feel like it's the place that I'm the most comfortable and I'm very fortunate that CBS News has not only recognized that, but also supported it. Yes, and um, reading the book, you really are reasonably chipper answering the phone at three in the morning because there's a lot of short notice work in what you do. I'm glad that is your takeaway. There was there was a moment in that book where I expressed that I wasn't so chipper, uh, delirium <laughs> nocturnum, because when you get a call at three in the morning, and I am a morning person, uh, it it's hard to snap out of sleep and into reality and then pack up everything you have and launch on wherever that assignment's gonna take you. It It is a skill I would like to think I have come close to perfecting over time, but when that phone call goes off suddenly at three in the morning, it, it still is difficult to really snap into work mode. Now, when most people are called, when all of us are called at three in the morning, it is rarely good news. In your case, it's someone else's bad news much of the time, right? They're calling you to go into something breaking that is not super positive. Yeah, that's correct. And and most of the time when we are launched, we don't exactly understand the landscape in which we are arriving. So it, it's it's flying in the dark to whatever location that you are arriving in and then boots on the ground trying to figure out exactly what the story is and where it takes you and finding the right people to speak with to get that full picture of the event that we're sent to. Right. Actually, I, I wrote down here, your niche is short notice disaster guy. They call you up and say, it seems like a really big fire. Go figure it out. Right. So and, and that's correct. And and that is I mean, when it comes to breaking news, that is the directive because the pieces haven't even been fully formed to know what the story is and how it's going to develop over time. So we land and we first start collecting those pieces. And then over time on the ground, the hope is you could connect the dots to get that better understanding of what unfolded 
And in the case of climate change fueled extreme weather, what can be done to protect more and more communities that are yeah, being Yeah, let, let's follow that connect the dots thing a little bit because yeah. I think you have cultivated an interesting skill set where this story is concerned. You have to be able to respond quickly, go in with a little bit of information, uh, be open to changing what the information is, obviously the travel stuff and mm -hmm. being open to being in new environments, and then a certain level of rigor around talking to officials, but then mm -hmm. empathy and rigor in talking to local people who are affected. Exactly, and it's always the local people affected that are the first that we meet. You have to be incredibly nimble when you arrive to wherever it is that you've been sent and you have to be incredibly open to receive whatever it is that you are welcomed into and for me i have always found that by listening and it sounds easy but oftentimes with deadline pressure trying to manage a newsroom that wants more information it can be hard sometimes to listen to the people that you're speaking with as you have all these other voices in your head but for me, over time, I hope I have learned to turn out those other voices, turn them off so that I could focus on those survivors, on right. the people that we're speaking with that have been through the worst moments of their life well, it's to get a better important. understanding of what they experienced. And then if there is accountability that that needs to be addressed, uh, we take that to officials. Uh, not every story leads to that kind of accountability, but more and more the stories that I'm on do oftentimes lead to that confrontation with officials. Yes, it's critically important on two levels, pick which one comes first. One is just being a good human being, and the other is it's the heart of the story, the person affected. If you're going to talk about government failures, mm -hmm. you need to talk about the person affected the most. Exactly, and survivors offer, in the case of climate change and the extreme weather that I'm reporting on, survivor guides. Through their stories, we can understand what they have been through, what can be done differently for others, uh, how to be rebuild, how to recover. Um, listening opens up the floodgates to understanding. And then as a journalist, it is then my job to mirror that back to our viewers and, and to do so in the purest form. So the more you listen and the better you are at it, the better I would like to think as a journalist myself, I am at then conveying and relaying that message to others. Well, I think in the book, you follow this process of connecting the dots in the micro level of going to the individual disaster. But the story of the book is the story of connecting the dots in a larger way as well. Mm -hmm. You cover a fire, you cover a hurricane, you cover a flood, you see damage to farms. Um, and eventually it becomes clear that these are all manifestations of something larger, yeah. which is climate change. I would, what was that process like? I would like to think that this book partly documents my own education doing this work. I've always believed as a journalist, storytelling is a powerful tool to understand the world around us. And I also realize my unique access that I have to the front lines of these extreme weather events fueled by climate change. And it's been covering wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and in doing so time and time again, oftentimes historic storms, one historic storm after the other, I've been able to clearly see the link between climate change, the way it's radicalizing our weather, and then the impact that, that weather has on our communities. It was my hope in setting out to write before it's gone, to take viewers and readers to those front lines through my words, help them visualize this and connect the dots in in ways that frankly television news pieces that can only run two minutes or so are incapable of doing mm. um, this was a cathartic experience for myself uh really documenting my own education with the hope of educating others as well taking them to those front lines yeah there used to be this saying in the business that's it from the TV side. We hope you go research more deeply. We yeah. hope you, you look for further information because you can only cover so much in a couple of minutes. It's the nature of things. Yeah, and when you're arriving to a scene, you know, breaking news, you don't even have the image yet. You don't know what that picture is. And it slowly develops over time. With every day that you're on the ground, you're getting a better sense of what has unfolded as that picture develops. Uh, writing this book for me was a collection of pictures from different storms that I have in the past at times treated as isolated individual events. Go in, report, 
leave, go to the next one, not mentioning the connections whatsoever. In longer form pieces, I've had the benefit of being able to connect those dots, but nothing quite like the benefit of writing 300 pages where I have a collection, a scrapbook of images, so to speak, where I can see the impacts that in our environmental crisis is having on different communities. And then I can clearly connect those dots. It was invaluable to be able to do so. It was eye-opening too, frankly, for me. When I set out to write this book, I wasn't exactly sure the direction I was going in, but it became very clear over time as I flipped through more and more pictures and videos from my travels and from the stories I covered and clearly saw the links. Mm. And after several years, just the progression of it, the magnitude of it, the weight of it. And as contemporary as it is, you seem to have organized it along almost uh, ancient lines by dividing it into fire, water, air, and earth. Talk about that structural choice a little bit. I wanted to mainly create some pacing uh, in my book. Uh, and if you read the book, you will see they are divided into many stories that are woven together. And I focused in on the different elements because all of those elements are impacted in one way or another by climate change. And in breaking them into those sections, I felt like it gave me the room to dive deeper and to also give more focus to specific voices, specific survivors that have experienced change in different ways based on those specific elements. And then there are um, real close-ups inside each one, I would mm -hmm. say for fire, the Paradise Fire which yeah. if you're a viewer in California, you know quite well. But spend a minute on each close-up. What was it about the Paradise Fire that was a paradigm for you? Paradise was a, a disaster that I think many still struggle to truly comprehend. I, I mean, most news agencies that were there on the ground in the immediate aftermath haven't returned back. Uh, I'm fortunate that CBS News has sent me back time and time again. I first arrived six months after the campfire destroyed 95% of paradise. When that fire happened, I was initially still based in London. And when I arrived, even after seeing those images on television, I was struck by the sheer scale of devastation, which could not be captured in a single frame. And then I was also struck by the survivors that we met. Uh, in this book, I specifically focus on a mother and daughter team, Kylie and Ellie Werbel, and their struggle to return back to paradise and to rebuild, while also confronted by questions of, are you crazy to even return back to this community? Should you go somewhere else? And they were committed to retaining and rebuilding their traditions, rebuilding their home. They saw this opportunity almost as a do-over with the knowledge that they now had, with the resources that they had from local leaders, now eyes wide open to the threat. They saw an opportunity to build back in a more resilient way. And I found that incredibly empowering. These are modern day American pioneers and unlikely ones at that, who before disaster struck, never once imagined that happening to themselves. And now this is their reality. And so many other people still, still can't imagine something like that ever happening to themselves. So through their stories, I hoped, and I say stories because I followed up with them year after year, I hope that they can open up the eyes of others who are on the flip side of luck and offer a survivor guide, a way of rebuilding or a way of protecting, whatever it may be, a way of taking action. Almost a new vigilance that yeah. this, the function of fire has been with us for age, for countless times, but there's something new here. And we'll get into that in a minute in terms of what you call man's impact upon the land, people mm -hmm. moving into these areas. Um, but let's move along through the other three. Which was your paradigm for the water section? You know, Cindy Miller uh, was a young woman, a teenager who was in her home at the time that Hurricane Laura struck. And her community, Leesville, Louisiana, was not evacuated. They weren't truly prepared for this storm. And sh sure enough, an oak tree was blown over by the powerful winds and crashed into the roof 
above the bedroom where she was reading and she did not survive. And we met her family and yet another example of we could never imagine this happening to ourselves. This was the most fragile time in their lives. We actually, when we rolled up to do this interview, I, I even spoke to my producer, Bill Applegate, who was with me at the time. I said, let's go and speak to them. Let's introduce ourselves. If they do not want to talk, let's leave. And we arrived and I thought I was speaking with the father and it turned out to be the family pastor who, as I apologized and tried to walk away and, and said, I'm so sorry for coming here. He thought we were a first responder. Uh, he introduced us to their family. And through their eyes, you get yet another sense of a fragile world. And one that is taken for granted, one that we believe will will be around, we'll have the ground underneath our feet, we'll have our children close by our side, and yet in a heartbeat, it all changed. And in telling that story, I first told it for the evening news, and it had incredible impact on the community and on our viewers. But I felt like so much of that interview, which we distilled down into just two minutes, was lost. And I really just wanted to tell the story of this young girl with dreams of going to Harvard, with the grades to get her into Harvard, faced by poverty and looking to get out of her small community to make a difference, to give back to her family, a flame put out. And in telling that story, I, I hoped that it would connect to readers in a way that opened their eyes. It did me, and I don't want to give too much away because people should read the book, but there are moments, and this had one, that I, I liked where you opened the aperture and showed the underlying global nature of the problem. For this hurricane has its roots in the behavior of heated water off of the Cape Mary mm -hmm. Islands, right? You know, so that's correct. There's this the birthplace of most of our hurricanes, both most, most of our major hurricanes, 80 to 85 percent of those hurricanes uh, come from uh, come from that location. And because of our warming water, which puts more moisture into the air, adding more atmospheric muscle, we're seeing hurricanes uh, quickly grow into catastrophic storms uh, over the past four decades. Noah has the research out there. There's been a 40 percent spike in the likelihood of a storm growing into a major hurricane like Hurricane Laura, which hit Louisiana and killed Cindy. I was saving this question for later, but uh, does this information kind of terrify you at times? Yeah, uh, it does. Uh, you know, I touched on this earlier when I first started reporting on extreme weather I was one of those people that spent so much time focused in on the weather behind me the rain the wind the flames if it was a wildfire uh, kind of razzle dazzle um, but but at the same time serving a very important purpose in that moment and warning people of a storm that could come uh, in a wildfire case, warning people of evacuations, it certainly served a role. But I did a disservice to myself and to my viewers by not eventually connecting the dots to climate change. And the more and more I spent time with researchers and, and looking at the science, and the more and more I saw the clear impacts that our extreme weather is having on our communities, it, it is terrifying. But what I do find um, to be inspiring is there are solutions, if we listen, that we can put in place to protect our communities. One of the main themes that I wrote down in a journal before I started writing this book, and I'm gonna talk about Lahaina to you, I'm sure, mm. is before every disaster, there is usually a scientist that has been ignored. Uh, why does that happen? Uh, one of the questions in the book, how can we change that? Uh, another question in the book. And I, and I hope that through some of the answers in the book, um, there is hope and there is a sense of empowerment provided to readers um, that, are, that are looking on and, and seeing these stories, perhaps for the first time in a much different perspective. Well, for this reader, at least, um, that micro macro balance also has it, it seeds in the hope because there are continuous references to people focused on recovery, focused mm -hmm. on overcoming, focused on memorializing, which is in many ways a forward-looking act again. And those are individual actions. Those kind of actions could be marshaled towards solving the larger problem as well. That's correct. And the time and time again, there is this, this, this discussion, and Paradise was a perfect example of this. Should people even return back? 
But the reality is there's an affordable housing crisis, not just in California, but across the country. There isn't enough land to absorb everybody. And there are opportunities to learn from these disasters. It's why we have building codes. Uh, we can, if we listen, if we listen to the science, if we listen to what is clearly unfolding and follow the evidence, we can find solutions to rebuild safer. And that's what's happening in paradise. I, I end the fire chapter back with Kylie and Ellie. They have returned. They have finally rebuilt. And they're only one of a quarter um, of the population that has returned at this point. So they are still very lonely, but they have a much more resilient community. All the power lines are now underground. A power line is what eventually sparked this fire that destroyed the town. They've created defensible space, which is removing dry grasses and shrubs and trees from around their home. And they've built back with more fire resistant materials. So they truly believe that in this do over that they now have in this second act, they have the ability to build a community that can survive the next century. Um, and, and, and certainly the science is pointing to that for them. They have not had to stand the test of another storm, but they stand firm in their decision. And across the country, other communities are facing similar decisions to stay or to leave. Oftentimes finding staying provides an opportunity in and of itself. Mm. Let's turn briefly to the air and earth situations, the, those, those stories there, because it touches both on um, different types of weather events and yep. human caused events in these cases, and also different parts of the country. Effectively, this is a mosaic that's touching the entire country. It is. I mean, just last year alone, two and a half million Americans were forced from their homes because of extreme weather. And there's a new report out uh, just last month showing that nearly half of all American homes are threatened by climate change. In the air section of the book, I focus on what meteorologists called the beast. This was a tornado that spawned from a supercell back in 2021 in December. And it passed through Kentucky, through Mayfield, and then through Dawson Springs. This was a mile wide tornado that carried on ground for more than 100 miles and destroyed everything in its path. And the research clearly shows that climate change is altering where the traditional tornado alley is now tracking. Uh, because of our warming climate, we are seeing these tornadoes appear more often uh, on the East Coast, closer to the Eastern side, uh, not so far West from the Mississippi where they traditionally are. And he called it, one of these researchers called this new tornado alley, tornado fatality alley, uh, really striking home the idea that more populations, bigger communities are now threatened by weather threats that they never once considered an issue or even factored in to their lifestyles, where they lived, where they built, places that they called home. And then finally turning to Earth, this is very much a human involvement or human mischance with nature, correct? It is, and it's, and it's not as visual as the other elements because in Earth, I specifically focus on our soil and agriculture and the impacts climate change are having on farmers. And to focus on this story, it was, it was, a, story, it was a chapter that was birthed from a visit to the Minnesota farm and um, rural helpline which had been set up in recent years specifically to address farmers who were contemplating suicide. Small farms face a number of threats. Climate change is one of them. Severe droughts, extreme flooding, crop failure, and the billions of dollars every year. And when you're a small farmer, you don't have the kind of acreage to absorb those losses. And so it was striking um, and very sad to see the condition in which our small farmers, small family owned businesses are struggling to survive. And these are the guardians of our soil. Uh, they grow in ways that science shows is more sustainable and supports more fertile land. What is lost when we lose this tradition, when we lose this heritage? So this isn't a book just about climate change, though that features strongly. It's sort of, as you say, man's impact on the land. And this gets into the kind of multi-determined causes and multivalent um, 
possible solutions we have for this because the habit we've changed the habitats even as the climate has changed we've changed the climate and we've changed the habitats around it and uh, that causes a growing population to move to a place like paradise yeah or that causes um, people to, to more in the Dust Bowl era people tilled the land not giving a thought to what the wind might do but there are or um, not building to take on larger hurricanes that come in mm -hmm. in every case is this accidental is it complicity are we just being lazy here I think it's a failure to imagine and and let me explain because I watched a TED talk with someone I'm sure you're familiar with, Dan Gilbert, the Harvard psychologist. He was specifically talking, this is years ago. I watched it on YouTube probably eight years ago. He was talking about keys to happiness. And during this discussion, he focused in on the prefrontal cortex, this part of our brain that is unique to us humans, doesn't exist in any other animal in the kingdom in this way. And it gives us this power to imagine. Uh, an evolutionary adaptation to essentially prevent us from doing stupid things. And this imagination is turned on in part through stories shared to us by friends, family, strangers, the media. And when that information is clear, when those stories are clear, we're very good at imagining. I was looking at and thinking about those anti-smoking campaigns, the ones that you see on television. I'm not sure if you've seen any of these where they feature someone in some state of suffering, warning others not to pick up a pack. I wonder just how effective that messaging was. And so I looked into this in New York City. The health department found for every dollar it spent on its ad campaign, it saved $32 in medical costs. So the message was very clear. It was easy for people to process. When it comes to climate change, I think a lot of people have turned that part of their imagination off. And I think they've done so because climate change can be abstract and can be overwhelming. For example, uh, there is a risk management firm called A on that tracks real estate. It found in the past four decades, six times more people moved into risky coastal communities than into safer nearby inland communities. I would like to think these are not people that are intentionally putting themselves and their families' lives in harm's way. After all, they, most of them have 30-year mortgages. They expect their homes to survive at least that long, if not longer. I think what this is, is a failure to imagine the worst case scenario and also a better way forward. And I think that failure in imagination comes from uh, maybe ineffective reporting and coverage of the climate crisis. And I think it also comes from government and action and leaders perhaps focused on other concerns for short term gains than climate change, which does not have an immediate payoff. Uh, as I know, you know, and so many viewers here know, to fight climate change, it's going to take a long time and the global community has to come together as one to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And the science is clear, even if we did that today, stopped all greenhouse gas emissions, it could take decades to reverse this trend. It's what's called the delayed feedback loop. I liken it to when you pop aspirin for a headache, it doesn't stop the headache immediately. The same is true for reducing our planet's fever. And to your point earlier, uh, I focus on this other change to provide other ideas for solutions that are more immediate. And that is habitat change, restoring our habitats, thinking about where we build, how we build, if we should build, conserving water, restoring wetlands, protecting our woodlands. These are things that we can take as individuals, depending on what community we're in, and we could take as individual communities to restore balance and to make our towns and our cities more resilient to whatever future storm exists out there. Right, I, I think you've put your finger on something very important about the tension of short-termism. People want to go live in rural areas and work from home has made that even more so now. And governments, tend to look for the quicker fix. Planning for the long term is just difficult because it's hard to justify the tax expenditure. Uh, it's hard to do these things. But we can build incentives. Yeah. And I think an area where there's both a great example and possibly an area for hope is La Haina. Let's talk about that a little mm. bit because that was highly multi multi-determined in terms of yeah. what happened. There's yeah, climate Lahaina change, provides. there's government, there's individual behavior converging on a disaster. Yeah. 
Un unfortunately, it is the perfect example of what could go wrong if we don't listen. And Lahaina offers lessons to all of us. So my team with CBS News, we were among the first network teams to arrive in the disaster zone of downtown Lahaina. 80% of the community was destroyed. You had more than 100 people that were killed. We couldn't drive through because we came up to a roadblock that police had put up. And so we bypassed it by chartering a boat. And an hour and a half later, we were dropped off on the cindered shoreline. And what we saw, I describe in my book as an environmental holocaust. You had home after home, business after business that had been decimated. And then we saw and spoke with survivors in a state of shock. They looked like ghosts as they were surveying what was left of their neighborhoods. So many without any home telling us that evacuation orders were never issued. I spoke with one manager at a nearby hotel who put into perspective what she described as a failed emergency response. She saw the smoke when the fire first sparked. She tried to evacuate, saw the traffic, turned back around to her hotel where hundreds of other guests who also couldn't evacuate stayed. Cell service was out. They had no idea what was going on. Power was out, no running water and limited food. So they stayed and waited for help. Day two comes. They had to ration their food to just children. They had an airport a mile and a half away. She wondered why help hadn't arrived yet. There was a dock behind this hotel. She wondered why nobody had pulled up to it. Then day three. Help still did not arrive. And she decided, praying to God the entire way that she was gonna drive out that 13 mile road to the neighboring town. She did so surprised to see no down power lines, no down trees, no first responders, and came up to that very same roadblock and saw a line of people with food and water trying to get in. Local leaders, they described this fire as an explosion, as a bomb going off, implying that there was no time to take action. But as we soon learned, there was a nearly decade long fuse that could have been put out because research there, scientists that come out with a paper and a plan saying that climate change had made the community vulnerable to fire. And they even had mitigation efforts, things that could be done to prevent this, including restoring wetlands, conserving water, uh, building and updating homes with fire resistant materials. And yet this plan was filed away, no action was taken in time, and those warnings unheeded became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I focused in on one home specifically because in the miles long disaster zone that we saw where nothing survived, there was one home, the home with the red roof as it's known today, that survived unscathed, where the homeowners there had updated their property, implementing those scientific remedies. They cleared out dry invasive grasses. They removed trees and bushes that were too close to the home. They put down almost like a, a rock moat with river stones along the foundation of the home that prevented the flames from reaching that foundation. And they used a red metal roof, which qualified for tax credits and reduced their insurance rates. And they ultimately made it out okay. That home was unscathed. Across the country, there are homes with the red roof uh, that survive other storms by other names. And all of these people share one thing in common. They took action. They took the initiative, even when local leaders weren't providing guidance at the time. And I, I think we all have that power. And this is my hope with this book. We all have this power to listen, to focus in on what threats our own individual communities face and to take that action to protect ourselves. So was Lahaina primarily a government failure? I think so. I, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say because all of these leaders, they're, they're good people. They, they don't want to see anybody in harm's way, but I think they struggled with what so many of us struggle with, a lack of imagination, a lack of listening, I don't know what was going on in their minds, but I would like to think that if they clearly understood the science that was presented to them, if they clearly understood the threats, that they would have taken action. Yes, because- Why they didn't, sorry. I don't know. No, no, no problem at all. But why they didn't, I don't know. It's a question that we have asked and I've tried many times to, to get sit down interviews and have been de denied time and time again. Well, that's telling in itself perhaps. Yeah. Um, and there is a government failure of reacting poorly in the moment. And it seems pretty much like having a fire burn for a couple of days without taking emergency yeah. steps would be that. Then and they're being investigated for that currently. We're waiting, I think April 17th is when the state is supposed to come out with its phase one investigation into the actions taken before, during, and after this fire. Because one thing is clear from being on the ground and specifically from speaking to that manager of that hotel, there was no reason to not have help 
in the immediate aftermath, especially with what she saw as she drove down that 13 mile road, not a single roadblock of any kind from trees or from power lines. So why there was that lack of emergency personnel, why that infrastructure didn't exist is one of these looming questions uh, that hopefully phase one of that investigation, which comes out later this month, will address. It's an unfortunate side effect in bureaucracies when there is a disaster to frequently try to control information as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And blocking off the roadway is perhaps an attempt at information control, not letting communications in and out. But then there's also the longer term government failure of not taking care of the new dryness, the climate change, Mm -hmm. not telling people to change their homes, not taking the steps that this individual with the red roof had taken on their house. And in part, compelling behavior on the populace, which is not the most popular thing to do, but in a sense, that's going to be incumbent on local and state and federal governments to compel behaviors to contend with this. That's correct. And to also find and help people gain access to federal funding that will allow them to take action. So much of these updates to the average person, including myself, seem overwhelming and expensive. Not a lot of people have a savings account where they can take this action on their own and then hope that they get a rebate check in the mail. So I think it's I think it's important for local leaders and for community leaders to assist those, to empower others with the information and with the tools that can link them to the funding that does exist. Uh, There is a government website, it's called toolkit.climate.gov, and anybody in any community across the country can access it and can see what benefits apply to their communities. This is tapping into the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure deal, more than a trillion dollars in funds to help in part assist battling climate change and habitat change. But that money means nothing if it's not being accessed. And the government is not, the federal government, is not going town to town knocking on doors saying, here's your money. They need local leaders to come forward saying, this is what we need for this problem in order to give that payout. So it's really important that local leaders, community leaders, and residents, residents are empowered here too, uh, do their homework and and take that action as a result. That would be the right action. Another problem, perhaps, is when they start doing this before there's a a disaster, they're going to come up across both short-termers and climate deniers. How many climate deniers did you meet in places that have been affected by disasters like this? And you know what's interesting? None. When I go into these communities, and maybe maybe they just don't say the words climate change. Maybe they don't say this was definitely climate change. But they say, Mother Nature, this weather has never happened here before. Something is changing. This is their awakening. And it's unfortunate that oftentimes it is a disaster that leads to it. But I, I have been confronted by plenty of climate deniers. If you go onto my X and you go onto my Instagram, I get messages all the time from people calling me an idiot, you name it, it exists. It's out there and I get to absorb all of that, it's lovely. But when you go to these front lines of, and, and you're speaking to people who I am sure, based on some of the bumper stickers on their cars, probably did not believe in climate change. And while maybe they're still not identifying it, saying it out loud, they realize you you see you see the recognition in their eyes these storms open up the eyes of these survivors in ways that they had been immune to before and i think it's so important that others who are on the flip side of luck who haven't really considered the threat open their eyes before it's too late Mm. this speaks to a question we have from the audience what is your experience of how impacted communities draw linkages between extreme weather they feel and the larger scope of climate change. um, Does it breed activism? Do they become more vocal? Do they seek more holistic approaches like we've been talking about? Yeah, and and thank you for that question. I, I won't say that I've experienced anyone that has necessarily become an activist, but I do think once you are struck by a weather disaster that uproots your life, Um, I have noticed in the people that I've spoken with, they start to see 
the world and the weather events that are happening around them in a whole different way. And they start to make those connections. Uh, in Paradise, I spoke with one person who left Paradise. She lost her home and she went to another region in Northern California, only to be threatened by another wildfire. So these are people that are really awake to the threats. The community that she had moved to, she thought was resilient enough, and, and it, it was. The fire never reached that community. But again, it has that triggering effect. And I think every person who has survived one of these storms, when I speak to them, they say they will never look at weather again. And they, they understand what's happening in Florida, what's happening in Hawaii, what's happening in California. They, they do see the dots and they see the connections between them. Mm. You uh, touch on something, perhaps not directly, but it struck me that on the one hand, you speak of honoring older traditions, native peoples who were stewards of the land, perhaps not mm -hmm. in a world full of climate change, but more attuned to nature's behavior and their behavior in turn. And you speak of honoring work working people who refuse to go, who had built good lives in these situations. And then on the other hand, there is now this need for regulation to mm -hmm to steer behavior. And there, on another level, you speak of gentrification by wildfire, that in paradise now, basically it's higher net income people who can afford to live there because yeah. they have to do more stuff. Um, there's just no solution that's gonna make everyone happy here, is there? There isn't, and I think in life, there is never a solution that will make everybody happy. I, I think about myself at a dinner table with my family uh, and trying to agree on something to eat. So when you then broaden that out to something like climate change and trying to find balance between to stay or to leave, to support or not support, you're going to make people naturally upset. I think the local governments uh, and our federal government have to work together to find a balance where we support communities that already exist, while at the same time actively discouraging building and development in areas that are not sustainable. I think it is important to support these communities because oftentimes these are lower income communities. And what happens when they vanish from that landscape? Well, that land is still there. And oftentimes for a huge discount, it is purchased by the haves those mm -hmm. with money, those who build on, in the case on the coast, sand castles, they put them up on, uh, on um, lifts and they're, they're able to heighten them and they're able to build a whole new life for themselves. But in doing so, you have people who don't have the money to do that. And oh, so you 48 hours after out. Lahaina, there were yeah. real estate speculators looking to get this fa once fantastic and someday again, fantastic land. And it worked. And, you know, we spoke with several people who received text messages and several people who knew friends who overcome by the grief and by the loss and overwhelmed with the thought of how to rebuild, decided to give up their land. Uh, they didn't have the money to support themselves by traveling an hour across the island to a, another community to work. And so they sold their land and moved somewhere else. Uh, but in doing so, uh, you lose the identity of a community and you also create friction in these host communities where these climate migrants move. So we need to address this to find ways for people to stay close to their home if they want to remain uh, to really keep the balance and to keep the fabric of our communities alive. I mean, to lose these main streets, uh, the toll that takes on those who are so entwined with them, emotionally, I, I can't even imagine. And mm. speaking to those who have had to make those decisions, it's life-changing and they never forget it and oftentimes regret it. You know, when you find yourself in situations of existential paradox, or manifest contradictions, impossible choices. The problem may be a failure of imagination, as you say, mm -hmm. or a problem of a evolving consciousness that has to reach a new perspective or a different level, which of course takes me to the iguana story. <laughs> Tell the iguana story. 
Uh, let, let me give you the Cliff Notes version of the Iguana story. So when I was a rookie reporter, this is back 2010, 2011, I was in Miami working for WPLG, the ABC affiliate. And I was sent on what I thought was a fool's errand at the time. I was told that the cold conditions that winter had made that night a perfect night for it to rain iguanas. Now, iguanas are, and when I first heard this, I said, what is this? Uh, apparently, well, there was an urban Also, you thought, story gold, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, honestly, I really thought, I, I, I was, we talked about cursing to open up this whole thing and getting one of those early calls. When I got that call late at night, I was like, this is... This is stupid. I'm like, getting pranked. I, I, I pulled this short straw. So iguanas are an invasive species to South Florida. They're from South America. They were introduced to South Florida in the 70s by pet owners who took them in and then introduced them to uh, the wetlands and, and the wilderness when they got too big. And initially, South Florida was a great home for iguanas. It was very similar to their South American home. But over the years, it started to get much colder in South Florida in the winters. And when it dips below 40 degrees, iguanas can't handle it. And so they go into a self-preservation mode, this hibernative state. And they come back to life, essentially turn back on when it warms back up. But because they live in trees at night, when it gets cold, it was quite possible for it to rain iguanas if they froze up there in that hibernative state and lost hold of the branch. And sure enough, on this golf course near Hollywood, um, I set up a camera and we saw a boom, dozen or boom, so boom. iguanas in their trees precar precariously hanging on these branches. And it just took a little bit of wind and one came crashing down. And it was wild to see that video is still featured on Jimmy Kimmel whenever it gets too cold in Florida. But there's a, a message and a point to this story because you would expect as it gets colder in Florida and it continues to have cold snaps that are historic or never before seen, uh, you would expect to see more raining iguanas. And while iguanas still do fall from trees, they don't do so nearly as much because research found that the iguana was able to adapt to this cold weather to the point where it is equally as active in the cold as it is in the warm in the warmth and so my point in writing about this kamikaze iguanas in my book was if a lizard brain can adapt to our changing weather i would like to think us as humans with our brains with our abilities can also find ways to adapt so far when you talk to government officials do you meet many who are interested in that? Do they see the problem in any kind of growing sense and want to take steps? Not so much in iguanas, but here <laughs> in California, here in California, yeah, actually, and this is a great segue to another animal, the beaver, because the beaver was was also found it is a, is a keystone species that creates wetlands and vibrant ecosystems with its with its dams. They were nearly eradicated, uh, hunted to extinction in the 1900s, and they were seen as nuisances for creating flood like conditions. But in the drought that we have seen here in the Western states, uh, a researcher found that after a wildfire, uh, one resilient piece of of land survived and it was all because of this wetland that was built essentially by a beaver dam and started to reintroduce them and more and more landowners are now inviting beavers back to their land to help restore wetlands and preserve water and the local government here uh, here in the state of california has actually uh, initiated a state agency that now assists with reintroducing beavers to help restore our wetlands. So I have spoken with leaders who are aware of the crisis and want to take action. And it's very easy to find them here in California. I think we, we need more leaders that are open to unique solutions um, and, and, and see our habitats as a line of first defense oh. um, and invest in, in it appropriately. I'd like to think we're super enlightened here in California. We're also receiving many, many climate disasters. And as yeah. you seem to show, nothing slaps you around and changes your consciousness like a climate disaster. That is very true. Let's talk about the news business a minute. Um, are your producers, are the higher ups aware of this problem? Do they want you to communicate these kind of things more vigorously? Yes. Yeah. CBS News, and I don't just say this because they pay my bills, but they do pay my bills. Um, they have been very supportive 
um, I, I held myself back in, in not initially making those connections to climate change. Nobody was telling me not to mention climate change in a report. And I've been very fortunate when I pitch my stories, when I'm not chasing after a storm, when I am pursuing stories that feature climate change or habitat change, I am always given the funding and the resources with my team to go out and cover those stories. And I, I, I can't thank CBS News enough for supporting that because I know of other places that are not as encouraging and supportive when it comes to telling these stories. And it is so critical that we continue to mention climate change in our reporting so that we can continue to connect those dots. In 2000, polls showed that only 5% of people knew a lot about climate change. Today, that's around 50% now. Mm. And a lot of that comes from information that is provided on the news, clearly identifying climate change and linking it to the threats we face. Okay, and then personally in your own consciousness, here's another audience question. From your reporting, what gives you hope and what is most concerning to you? Thank you for that question. What gives me hope is the resiliency, the spirit that I see in people who have been through the worst and how despite everything they've lost, they have moved on and found ways of building back better. Uh, to see that, to know that this is within all of us, um, that gives me hope and, and hope that we can use that resiliency and put it into action before the next storm hits, not after. Um, what gives me a pause for concern is how politicized climate change has become uh, for short-term gains, I believe, and how the misinformation that is put out there is having the counter effect um, and bringing people deeper and deeper into a darker place where that part of our brain that allows us to imagine remains turned off. So I think the way to combat that, at least from my perspective as a journalist, is to continue to shout as much as I can in my stories the truth uh, as the science shows and clearly linking those connections. But of course, I... I am concerned about the misinformation and the way that that spreads, no pun intended, like wildfire online and then in the minds of people. Mm. Um, and then there's a, I hope this isn't an awkward question. We mentioned it earlier. Uh, the kind of personal guilt and personal mm. consciousness change one goes through. And I've had this as a reporter too, where I think, oh God, I'm going on another jet. You know, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. adding to the problem even as I seek to explain the problem. And you're driving around, you're carpooling when possible. Um, is guilt helpful? It is helpful because it's the beginning of trying to maybe find another solution. These are tools that have become very valuable to getting me around, to telling stories. I would like to ultimately think that there is a benefit from from using cars, from using jets to jet off to the next location, ultimately in our reporting and how we can open up the eyes of others. Um, we got to where we are today because of fossil fuels. I don't think that we should have shame in that. I think what we should have shame in is moving forward and not trying to find a more sustainable future. I think once my tools that I use become more sustainable, it's dangerous to drive into a wildfire with an electric vehicle. Uh, we keep our cars on sometimes just to keep some of the smoke out. Um, if we ever had a battery issue or ran into a very remote community where there is no charging, that wouldn't work for us. But uh, I will, once we have tools that are safe for us to use, um, certainly implement those. But in the meantime, unfortunately, you're right. I, I drive cars with gas and I fly on planes with gas and and I do feel guilty about that but it's always in the back of my head and I'm always thinking about what the benefit ultimately is from that and I think the stories that we share ultimately do more good than bad I, I think many of us share that dilemma and yeah we we do steps and we think about what we can do collectively you know there there are individual steps and there are more powerful collective steps I've certainly felt a certain kind of guilt or almost need to apologize to my as yet unborn grandchildren about mm. the world they're going to inhabit. But 
they only deserve my apology, or they, they only, how shall I put this? My apology will be more blameful if I don't take steps now, if yeah. with the knowledge. We came into this without knowledge, now we have knowledge. If we don't act, that's the real guilt and fault. I agree, and I think that's an important point. You know, what is in the past is in the past. But the moment that you become aware of something, the moment you understand something, that inaction, I think, is where the guilt should then spark. To not take action on something that you have become educated on and understand and see firsthand, um, I, I think that's what we need to focus on, not mm. on past actions. I think there is always room for a fresh start. And today is that day for many people. It, it's that day for those that lose their homes in whatever moment that is. Um, hopefully as more people turn on that part of their imagination, that moment of awakening uh, needs to be the moment they take action, not sit back and not go business as usual, but move forward in a new way. Let's take a couple more audience questions. Is inaction a money problem or a knowledge problem? Um, is it both a lack problem uh, on an individual and on a government level? Is it funds I think it's or is it awareness? I, I, think, I think it's both. I think it's an education issue. I, I think it can be overwhelming to, you know, think of the DMV, think of any, any government experience. Uh, it, there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape. And there aren't a lot of guides out there that are saying, take my hand, let me show you through. Let me, let me lead you to this resource. So knowledge is power and is its own currency. Then of course, there is money. Uh, people without money don't have the kinds of budgets, the kinds of savings accounts, as I mentioned earlier, to put the money up front for costly updates, hoping that sometime in the future, they'll get a rebate. Um, so I, I do think money does become an issue for lower income families. And it's why you're seeing in some communities, you're seeing wealthier people move in, making those costly repairs or updates immediately. They have the accounts, the money, to sit back and wait for those rebates. So I, I do think it is both, but I do think that knowledge can overcome some of those financial shortcomings. if if people can be led, and I think leaders in local communities really have to play a critical role here in guiding these people, they're the residents of each community, to ways to get funding to help restore their own properties, and hopefully in doing so, restore entire communities. Well, that touches on another audience question. Uh, how can we preserve community identity as we face inevitable change? Uh, try to act before the disaster is what you seem to be indicating. That's what I would say, uh, because that's the only way to truly preserve. You know, if people think updating their homes or changing the landscape or restoring wetlands is a big change, then they need to go to some of these communities that have been through disastrous change, because there is no going back from that. And communities that are still existing without any threat from any kind of extreme weather event, this is an opportunity. And, and I hope this is a message that now is the time to take action. We all have to update and improve. We update our phones all the time. We update technology. We update a lot of things in our life uh, that should also apply to our homes and our properties, which ultimately protect us and mm -hmm. give us shelter. There is another human dimension of this, which you touch on at places in the book, as when you talk about the hurricanes that originate off West Africa. In the prologue, you mentioned Syria and mm -hmm. that, and I think it's worth mentioning both on uh, uh, a story, as a story in itself about the kind of conflicts yeah. that lie ahead and then also the effects we can expect to see on a global basis from climate change. And Syria is certainly an extreme example, but one that we must listen to because years, be years before the civil war broke out, you had farming communities and farmers that were warning the local governments that because of crop failure due to drought, due to climate change, they were unable to survive. And if action wasn't taken, if water wasn't provided, if wetlands weren't restored, if waterways weren't protected, there would be a mass migration into urban centers. There was an action, there was that migration, there was a conflict point in urban centers that led to protests that then led to a government overreach 
which sparked the civil war that we have today, or that has just come to an end pretty much, and a power vacuum that gave rise to groups like ISIS. Now, again, a very extreme example, but if we don't take action here, we will see similar fault lines, not as extreme, but where we have mass migration, which is already happening. We saw that with Hurricane Katrina, it continues to happen in our own country. I mentioned two and a half million Americans were forced from their homes last year. Then you also have the crisis on the border with Mexico, where many migrants passing through are also impacted in their home countries from climate change. And you're going to have people and communities that find conflict. And that's already happening, and it will continue to happen unless we pay attention to these fault lines. Yes, and it will be a type of migration the world hasn't seen before because people will be ripped from their homes and undergo the economic chaos of that, but also be digitally connected to each other. They will mm -hmm. remain communities even as they're transported across the world. Yeah. And it can be shared positivity or it can be shared miserization and anger yeah and i mean these you know these migrations cause real anger to your point in paradise chico is just a 20 minute drive away following the fire in paradise you had the population grow by 20,000 people. Many of them were displaced from the fire in paradise. And as a result, you saw frustration from locals who came out against proposals for affordable housing developments there. Following Hurricane Katrina, the University of Georgia, found, um, or was it the Georgetown, I should say, not the University of Georgia, Georgetown University found that host communities became less supportive of the funding of programs to help uh, the poor and African-Americans. So you're going to continue to see these massive shifts and this kind of conflict uh, with more migration if we don't continue to take action now. I have another um, audience question I wish to address in our closing minutes. Are you able to work with colleagues who report on business, energy, finance, et cetera, to tell more holistic stories about climate and not just the disaster that ends. We do. So we're at CBS. We have a wealth of journalists with specialties um, that inform all of our reporting. We also have an investigative team as well. Uh, one example was when we were covering um, wood pellets, the wood pellet industry in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, this is the chopping down of forests and turning trees into wood pellets that are then burned for energy. And it was being sold as green power um, by one of the main companies in Viva, who just two weeks ago filed for bankruptcy. So we did that story uh, and that wasn't an extreme weather event. Uh, that was a story that we spent months developing, uh, working across all platforms at CBS News and across all departments to make sure that we got that story right. And there are many stories that follow a similar example of that collaboration. And I think, and it's a great question, that collaboration um, really leads to a very comprehensive story. And perhaps as a last question from the audience, how do you feel, how do you find your own resilience when being confronted by disaster after disaster? Mm -hmm. When you get that next three in the morning call, yeah. what, what keeps you going? My husband, my husband, for one, who tells me, you'll be fine. You'll he does seem like show. a very supportive person in the book. He is, he is very, very supportive, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to come home to a family that understands um, and allows you to unravel and deflate and have that space to kind of process. Writing in my journal has been very cathartic. I have a number of journals that influenced um, this book. And then out in the field, it's the team that you're working with. Um, my, my One of my producers, Christian Duran, I was just talking to him about this. I would not have been able to get through Lahaina without him and the conversations we had, uh, the emotional toll of talking to people day after day that have been through so much. And then the guilt of also being able to return back home to a house that exists that still survives in a in a beautiful community i live in hollywood um there is there is a toll that that takes and i think communicating sharing stories sharing that space with others when it's out in the field with my colleagues when it's at home with my husband i think that's really helped get me through well i think it certainly promotes unawareness and a kind of positivity and i thank you for that 
Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Jonathan Vigliotti, thank you so much for being with us. Thank and you. thank you also to our viewers. Uh, you can get your hands on a copy of Jonathan's book, Before It's Gone, Field Notes from the Front Lines of Climate Change in Small Town America at your local bookstore. I encourage you, it's an excellent read. If you would like to engage in future programs or support the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, please visit the website at www.commonwealthclub.org. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Jonathan, thank you so much. Thank you, Quentin. I appreciate the conversation. <laughs>